And this brings us back to the first case study. Other than humpbacks and orcas, the cetaceans found within this scary include fin whales, dolls porpoises, and Pacific white-sided dolphins. I spent last summer as a researcher for the North Coast Cetacean Society, NCCS, owned and operated by Janie Ray and Herman Muter. These fjords form the western border of the Great Bear Rainforest, the largest intact temperate rainforest in the world. The lab, in a protected lagoon called Whale Point, is within the traditional territory of the Gitgat First Nation, whose elders are now dear friends of Herman and Janie. Within 30 minutes of meeting Herman at the ferry dock, a humpback whale breached within 50 feet of our tiny vessel. That night, two wolves fought over food scraps on Whale Point's beach. The next morning, I woke up to find fresh wolf feces right outside my tent. I could tell it was going to be an interesting summer. Whale Point is both a home and a research lab. Herman and Janie built all the structures themselves. Year-round, they are alone on this island a day's boat ride from the nearest paved road. I lived in my tent. We took baths using wood fire, with a view that looked over the water. Often, from the tub, I could watch humpbacks milling about just offshore. NCCS has four primary research priorities. Participating in the North Coast Network of Orca Research, understanding the structure of the resident humpback whale population, bioacoustics, which is a fancy term for sounds animals make, and establishing the area as a critical habitat for cetaceans. To accomplish these goals, they use boat surveys, land-based surveys, and a network of underwater microphones called hydrophones. Every week, NCCS conducts at least one boat survey of the surrounding fjords. The black line here denotes their standard route. All summer, research volunteers, like me, take shifts monitoring the viewshed from land. NCCS also supports an even more remote outcamp, where one man named James has spent the last three summers alone in a shack conducting his own land surveys. He's an eccentric fellow, but the best scientist I've ever met. This is the Society's hydrophone network. With its four stationed receivers, NCCS can monitor all underwater activity along an entire transect of the coastal fjords. And, 24 hours a day, sounds are projected throughout Whale Point via a network of hidden speakers. It's a surreal lifestyle, watching above water and listening below. The orcas that live on the BC coast have been monitored for almost 40 years, the longest running study of any cetacean population. It started in 1973, when a man named Michael Big realized that you can distinguish between individual orcas by their unique dorsal fin shapes, scars, and discolorations. Even within a single nuclear family of related orcas, their dorsal fins are incredibly varied. Males have very tall, straight, and phallic dorsal fins. Even when comparing the fins of three orca brothers, you can see that each dorsal fin is entirely unique, like a zebra's stripes. Females have curved fins with rounded tips, and as juveniles, both male and female orcas look the same, so researchers do not yet know the sexes of these four young orca. Since the 70s, researchers have been taking photos of these orca from the coasts of Vancouver Island in Alaska. No one knew what was happening in between until six years ago, when Herman and Janie moved to Whale Point. Now, NCCS is a critical component of the North Coast's orca research network. There are actually three different populations of orca on the coast, and they have almost nothing at all to do with each other. They don't interbreed, they don't communicate with each other, and they all eat different things. You can tell them apart by their dorsal fins. Resident orcas, the most common and conspicuous kind, have curved fins, the tips rounded except for the rear corner. Transient orcas have sharply pointed, shark-like, menacing fins. No one knew this population existed until the 1980s, and for years they were so rarely seen that researchers assumed they were nomadic, aimlessly wandering the Pacific, hence the name transient. But it turns out they are just as residential as the resident orcas. They call the BC fjords home too, but their original name sticks. The dorsals of offshore orca are fully rounded. Even less is known about these guys. No one knew they existed until the 90s. They live offshore and are a complete mystery, 
We have no guess as to what they eat or how many of them are out there. They are wild cards. Much more is known about residents and transients. They occupy the exact same fjord habitats, but eat entirely different things, without any overlap. Residents eat only fish. Resident orcas tend to be playful, very vocal, and very carefree. Transients are all business. They are the mammal and bird hunters. They never touch fish. Because their prey have great underwater hearing, they hunt in silence, almost never vocalizing. They even muffle their breaths. They are living stealth. They are badasses. Transients are the true killer whales. They will hunt anything without scales. They are not daunted by size or speed. They have been known to hunt down baleen whales, as evidenced by this photo of a stranded transient stomach contents. The transients are ruthless, pitiless hunters, taking great risks as they pursue their crafty prey. Sometimes, during a chase, they accidentally beach themselves. Now, would a transient attack a human? Well, there's never been an attack on record, but at times they have been unnervingly curious about us. Both residents and transients mainly hang out in the Canadian fjords during the summer, which is when salmon head back to their ancestral streams to spawn. Ever since the government stopped fishermen from shooting them, and started limiting salmon catches, the numbers of both populations have been increasing steadily. Both also navigate British Columbia's scary array in routes that take full advantage of the coast's massive tidal flux. They either ride the tide to save energy, or they go against the tide to catch the animals that are going with it. It is like clockwork. This is another example of a direct link between fjord dynamics and cetaceans, between geology and whales. The BC orcas can be divided into several different levels of organization. At the top are the three populations, the residents, transients, and the offshores. We'll use the residents for this example since they are the best known. Within the residents are two broad communities, the northern and southern subpopulations of residents. No interbreeding is known to occur between the two. We'll continue on with the northern orcas since they are what I studied at Whale Point. Within the northern orcas, there are three clans, the A-clan, G-clan, and R-clan, divided according to the kind of calls they make. It turns out that the acoustic relationships between orca pods, clans, and communities almost perfectly reflect genetic relationships. We can use sound as an approach to orca evolutionary biology. Each clan has a very distinct sound. Let's compare the typical recordings from each clan. First, the calls of the A-Clan. And here is the G-Clan. And lastly, the R-Clan. We'll continue on with the A-Clan, since it is the most numerous and best known of the three. Within each clan, there are pods, which are the family units. All orca within a pod are part of a single extended family. Sometimes, when a pod gets too big, it will break into smaller traveling units. These are the matrilines, the nuclear family units. All orca within the matriline are either children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren of its matriarch. The photo ID catalog for orca is organized down to the matriline. Here is a typical page. You can see that researchers named this matriarch I-11, so that is the name of the matriline. She also turns out to be the namesake for the entire pod, perhaps because she is over 55 years old. Just as humans have different languages, vocabularies, and dialects, so too do orcas. Here is a table of all the calls the northern resident orcas are known to make. 
Each row represents a distinct call type. You can think of this as a word in the ORCA language dictionary. All ORCAs communicate by picking and choosing from a lexicon of about 43 words. The columns represent the different pods, organized by clan. Each clan has a distinct limited lexicon, which is a subset of this entire list. For instance, the A clan only uses these calls to communicate. Spectrographs of the calls make it possible to visualize these sounds. For instance, the N1 call from the A4 pod looks like this, and it sounds like this. That is a classic orca sound. And here's my favorite call, N11. You can tell it will not sound as pleasant as N1, but it reminds me of a really upset dinosaur. But real nature is never as neat as a catalog. There are plenty of orca sounds that this list does not include. I'm going to play a recording from one of my last days at NCCS, when the A4 pod came by. We hopped into the boat, dropped down a mobile hydrophone, and the orcas actually came to us to see what we were up to. You'll hear a lot of different things going on. Here are some things to listen for. Toward the beginning, you will hear some classic cataloged call types. Then you will hear a huge smack. That is one of the A4 males breaching and landing right next to the boat. You will also hear a lot of rapid creaking sounds. That is the orca's echolocation. And towards the end of the recording, you will hear some very loud knocking sounds. These are actually echolocation bursts, typically made during hunting behavior, possibly used to stun prey. When we picked up those sounds, an orca had her forehead right up to the hydrophone, just floating there. Okay, so here we go. Here comes the breach. Right there. Here comes the echolocation burst. Her forehead is right next to the hydrophone. 